Allow me to begin this message by saying that we live in a sin-cursed world. Therefore, because the world is sin-cursed, there are tragedies, and accidents, misfortunes, and catastrophes that happen often in this world. The month of May as a whole has had 442 reported tornadoes through May the 27th. Confirmed tornadoes in the U.S. between May the 16th and the 30th, just 15 days, the confirmed ones were 226 tornadoes. That's something in there. Columbia University of South Carolina reported the highest temperature on May the 25th of this year of 104 degrees, which broke the previous record of 102 degrees on May the 27th, 2000. Isn't that something? Things are happening. 2019, even the winter storms. There were 19 named storms from January through April of 2019. The names were Fisher, Gear, Hopper, Andrea, Jaden, Kai, Lucian, Maya, Nadine, Oren, Petra, Quana, Ryan, Scott, Taylor, Olma, Vaughn, Wesley, and Zayla, Zyla, excuse me. All of these storms are taking place. Sin-cursed world. It's affecting everything. We're praying for the lives that were lost uh, in Virginia Beach. You see that? Twelve, last I heard, counting the shooter. Eleven people who started their day like we started ours who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And these people, their families are bereft. They've suffered these great losses. We live in a world that is filled with tragedies. Are you praying for me? Accidents, misfortunes, catastrophes. Suffering comes from living in a broken, fallen world. God said to Adam in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast broken, hast hearkened, excuse me, unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. This is what will come to you. You don't have to plant thorns. You notice this? You don't, you don't, you don't have to plant weeds. The concrete can't keep them out. 
Amen. They just grow. It's part of the curse. It led to things that have caused other problems. We needed insecticides to kill insects, to kill weeds and things like that. And some of those things are killing people. All of this is because the world is sin cursed. God said this, and you may as well get used to it, because there's no way around it. In the sweat of thy face, in the sweat of thy brow, shall thou eat bread till thou return. How long will it be? Till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Romans chapter 8 tells us something about this world that we're living in. That uh, the whole creation groaneth and mourns for the manifestation of the sons of God. Romans 8 and 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. The entire created universe is groaning. The planet is mourning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And the, the planet is, re, is in rebellion against the sin that's taking place on it. As a result of the world being in a fallen state, life is everything but fast. In fact, life can be so unfair. Solomon speaks to the ways of this life. And if you fully understand this, you won't whine too much. You won't whine too much when times are bad and you won't become too smug when everything goes your way. Amen. Turn to Ecclesiastes. The word Ecclesiastes literally means the preacher. Amen. The speaker of a called out assembly. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11 tells us something about this life. Solomon said, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. The fastest man don't always win nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise. There are, very, there are people who are very smart and intelligent, and they're hungry. Neither bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to all. For man also knoweth not, listen, his time as the fish that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. None of us know where death is. None of us know where a fatal heart attack is or a stroke is. I told them this morning that the airline I used lost my luggage, lost my bags. I was vexed this morning about that. I guess I still am. <laughs> but you know what? It could have been that we lost our lives. These things happen. Am I, am I, am I right? You know yourself that sometimes the best team does not win. Amen. Sometimes the better of the two fighters do not win the boxing match. Life can be unfair. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 15 says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perish in his righteousness. 
And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. You see that? We, we like to feel that if you just do right, everything will work out. But the truth is there are people who do right. And things do not work out for them. And there are others who do wrong. And seemingly everything go their way. Sitting over there, he's 99 years old and still smoking. <sighs> and, and yet things go, things happen like this often in life. When you understand that you can cope with life better. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 14 tells us something interesting. It says... There is a vanity which is done upon the earth that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. And again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said this also is vanity. There are times when a good man gets out of life what a wicked man deserves. It just happens that way. There are times in life that a wicked man gets away with murder. And he's wicked, but he's on top. And you are just, and you're struggling on the bottom. And if you don't understand these principles, you'll get mad with God. And say, Lord, this is not fair. And the Lord's response to you is, precisely. That's the point. It's a sin-cursed world. And a sin-cursed world is not a fair world. So don't be envious of that person whom you know aren't who they should be. But yet they get the promotion. And you are who or what you should be. And you do not get the promotion. Don't let that thing vex you and bother you and keep you up late at night because such are the ways of a sin-cursed world. Now there is an equalizer that will happen to everybody, uh, good and bad. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 14 says, tells us, um, before I get to the equalizer, something else that's interesting that I want you to know. Uh, we need to know how to, to respond to life. In chapter 7 and verse 14 says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, God also has set one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after himself. The point is, when things are going your way, you better celebrate. And, and be glad because you don't know when things may turn against you. See, some of us are, are sad when we ought to be rejoicing. Amen. Upset when we ought to be glad that God has blessed us the way that he has. Amen. So, so enjoy your life. And when the Lord opens a door for you and let good things happen for you, uh, flow in those things and, 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 and let him, praise the Lord, let him bless you real good because you never know what tomorrow may bring. Am I right about that? Amen. The Bible teaches us in the day of prosperity, rejoice. For all things have I seen in the days of my vanity that there, there are, there's a just man that perish in his righteousness and there is a wicked man who prolong his days. And the one thing that happens to all of us saints is that all men die. And see, after death, Death is the great equalizer. Amen. 
Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9 and 3, this is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live and after they go to the dead. The one event that happens to all is that all men die. Once appointed unto man uh, to die, and then after death, the Bible says, the judgment. Most of us, bear with me for just a few more minutes. Most of us, just think about this. Most of us are stewards of a lot of things that we do not deserve. Such as education, health, nationality. Most of the world views us with an unfair advantage just by virtue of being Americans. Why do you think that we're having the problems at the borders that we're having? Those people know that the standard of living, the opportunities here are much greater than the opportunities where they were born. And my question to you, do you think it's fair? Do you think you deserve to be born? Do you think it's fair to the man, let me rephrase it, who was born in a poor country? And you were born in the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth? There has never been a standard of, of living on earth like the standard that America offers. There's never been a, a, a country on earth that offers the opportunities that this country offers. This is one of the few places on earth where a person does not have to remain in the category and in the status that they were born in. In America, we see rags to riches stories all the time. The single largest uh, producer of black millionaires, the NFL, the National Football uh, uh, League, is not uh, an international league. Is it fair that your son or your, your son who's born in America? If he, if he grows and get the stature and, the, and, the, and he puts the work in, is it fair that he has the opportunity to go to the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball and then other kids who grow to be just as big but because of where they were born, they don't have that opportunity. Is it fair that you have the opportunity to live in a country where the education is free. All you got to do is just get up and go to school. Free. Free. Show up. Praise the Lord. And, and they'll provide a bus for you. In this country. You get a bus and lunch. And breakfast. In this country. Is it fair? Is it fair that you get this and I receive this, and yet there are people born in countries where there are no schools. There are people born in countries oh, where there is no middle class. The people are either rich or they're poor. Is it fair? Is it fair? See, life is unfair. That's, that's the whole point of it. And when you start talking about the unfair things of life, most of us begin to think that we're victims. But I want to show you also that you have a lot of things going your way that is yours uh, that you didn't earn. Is it fair for you to be sitting there sighted and for someone else to be sitting next to you blind? Is it fair to them that they were congenial blind? They were born blind and you were born sighted. Who was treated fairly? Is it fair that you were born with legs that work? And we see others who were born with bodies that do not participate. Is it fair? 
I hear stories of people who have contracted lung cancer who've never smoked. And there are people who smoke a pack a day and, and, and don't have the lung cancer yet. Is it fair? You all don't like me today. Is it fair? You cheated one time and got AIDS. You cheated one time and got pregnant. You cheated one time and got herpes. Someone else cheated a thousand times and none of those things happened to him. Is it fair? Oh, my friends, life can be very unfair. And I say life here is unfair. Praise the Lord. We will get our just desserts someday. We'll get fairness. Amen. But not in this life. Our text deals with a dialogue about human suffering and evil. Bible says that some people at a certain season they seized on the the moment they took advantage of the moment the kairos time they took advantage of an opportunity to either tell Jesus a story which is written, it is not written in the form of a question, but they were actually questioning him about life and human sufferings. And it's juxtaposed to uh, their thinking on these matters. The Bible says in verse 1, there were present at that, at that season some that told him of the Gadareans, the Galileans, Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now Luke tells us where Jesus was. According to Luke's gospel, chapter 11 and verse 37, he was at a unnamed Pharisee's house. According to Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, the crowd of people kept growing to the point that Luke calls it an innumerable multitude of people. This was during uh, more than likely our Lord's Galilean ministry and uh, many of the people there were Galilean and most of them, whether Galilean or not, they were Jews. And there was dialogue going back and forth. The Pharisees had spoken, different ones, but had asked our Lord questions, and, uh, and he now uh, begins to hear them tell him a story about something that happened to some Galileans. Some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled. The tragedy, the murder that they were spoken of here Pilate, whom the Jews hated, had appropriated money from the temple treasure. He had taken their money to help finance an aqueduct that he was building. He ran out of tax money. Pilate must have been a liberal. Well, one of the problems with liberalism is, uh, Margaret Thatcher said, sooner or later you run out of other people's money. So he ran out of money, so he went to the temple and took some of the temple money to finance his government project. Government operated the same way forever. You're talking about transfer of wealth. Take your money and spend your money like they know best how to spend your money. It's almost like uh, income tax time. We shout to them, hey, let me tell you what I got back. 
They gave me my money. They didn't give you. It was your money to start with. You worked and earned the money. They took, they take our money, keep it for 12 months, and give us back a portion of it, and they use it interest-free. And you get fewer and fewer deductions that help you get back more and more of money that was yours in the first place. What a system. Now they're trying to tell us that they know better what to do with our health care. Now if you believe that they, that the government should manage health care, just, just, just go to the driver's license place. Go to anything that they run and see the inefficiencies. Praise the Lord. The, the private sector does those things better because the private sector understands that if they get it wrong, they lose customers. Only government will have a line with 50 people in it and the folks stop and go to lunch will turn around and sit there and eat their lunch with people, people waiting in line. The private sector won't do that because they know you'll go somewhere else. But when they know that they got the only ball in town, you're going to stand right there, mad as fire, but you're going to wait. Pilate took their money. Now, I am not, I am not, just for the record, I am not, I, I, I am not a proponent of no government. That's not, that's not my position, because we need government. But I think that uh, smaller government uh, is better. Praise the Lord. Smaller government. Hmm. Government seems to be the problem. Be, be, beware when they rush in as a solution. Look at, look at how they cured black folk. Look at where we are after all their years. You know what? We got smart. Folk, you know what folk decided? You know what? I ain't going to stay on no welfare. I'm, I'm going to get me a job. I'm going to make my life better because I can do better than these crumbs that they're giving me. And praise the Lord. The preacher was talking about government cheese the other day. Thank God for it. But you know what? You don't want to depend on that. Buy your, make your own money. Get a job. Start your own business. Think and buy all, buy all the cheese you want. You will always be able to do better than what they will give you. And if you don't think it's a trap, get on the welfare and then try to get off. Try and get off. Oh, they take everything from you right away. They cut you off. Cold turkey. That's designed. That's like the man who's trying to keep the woman shocking with him. Well, if you leave me, where are you going to stay? Where are you going to go? And oh, she want to leave so bad, but she's scared. She don't have anywhere to go. And so she finally said, if I have to sleep outside, I'm leaving the devil. You, you are no good. And then she goes out there only to find out that she can make it. That she should have left years ago. Years ago. My God. Black folk and white folk marched together for civil rights. Blacks and Jews marched together for civil rights. But at some point, the Jew made the turn toward the cash register. We kept protesting. See, we sung, we shall overcome too long. They went and overcame. See, at a certain point, at a certain point, oh, you don't like my preaching, but at a certain point, you got to say, all right, now I've get, we've gotten as much as we're going to get through this angle. And if there's anybody in here today who think they're going to finally give us some reparations. Now, now, I got to get back to this. But now, if you think that that's going to happen, something's wrong with it. The statute of limitations has run out. All the people who would do reparations die. Their children die. Now, well, if, 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 we, had, if we gave them out now, uh, since we've been so mingled and co-mingled, white folk gonna get reparations too because they got slavery in their blood. 
And some of the people who we think are supposed to get them, like Kamala Harris, found out that her family owns slaves. So she can't get reparations because she, uh, her family owned them. So there are blacks who owned it. There are whites who got black blood in them whose descendants were slaves. How are you going to figure out who gets the money? You know what we got to do with that one? We got to let that go. And get your reparation every payday through working a job and running a business. And tell the Lord, thank you. Oh, you don't like that. Pilate stole the money. <laughs> he took the money from the temple treasurer and a large crowd of Jews gathered in protest of what Pilate uh, did. So Pilate had soldiers, he was an evil man, to dress as civilians, to mingle in the mob, all right, to act like the protesters, to have concealed weapons. And when the time was right, they pulled out their weapons and began to uh, murder their own Jewish brethren. And people were mingled. This even caused their hatred uh, to even grow. What a wicked thing he did. And the thing about the Jews who were protesting that day, they were peacefully protesting. Amen. They weren't throwing, uh, they weren't looting, breaking into stores. You know, when Katrina hit uh, New Orleans, I saw people still in flat screens and things. And that was no power. You know, the, the, the storm, the, I mean, the, the storm had, the storm had taken everything. The house was going down the roof. <laughs> There's the house going down the roof. And you got <laughs> These people were peacefully protesting wasn't nobody screaming burn this mother down they were protesting peacefully and they were murdered and I'm certainly not implying that people who scream search obscenities should be murdered either I don't think anybody should be killed uh, for peacefully protesting and Hopefully those who protest in an unpeaceful manner won't push it to where uh, they get themselves hurt because that's not wise to bring that upon yourself. Amen. So this thing, he ki they killed those people and the people hated it. Now, what's interesting in our text, and I'm preaching too long on this, what's interesting in our text is that Jesus does not deal with what Pilate did at all. He doesn't call Pilate's actions wrong. He doesn't call them right. He doesn't even address Pilate's heinous act, actions. Instead of discussing Pilate's sin, Jesus decided to deal with the sins of the people who reported the story to him. They said, Jesus, he killed the Galileans. He mingled their blood with their sacrifices as they protested. Him taking money from the temple. Our Lord's response was, do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? 
See, Jesus knew that the Jews believed that when tragedies happened, that it was divine judgment against those to whom it happened. He knew that they believed that these people whom Pilate killed must have been exceptionally sinful. He knew that in their reporting the story, as much as they hated Pilate, they felt that those people who were killed deserved the misfortune that came their way. They believed that misfortune was the result of wrongdoing. We see this in John's Gospel, chapter 9, and verse 2. They asked the Lord when they saw a man blind from his birth. His disciples even asked him, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents? That he should be, that he was born blind. Jesus' answer was consistent. Neither. Hallelujah. Neither the man nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. They were under the impression that these people had sinned. And the key, you can see it, you can see it if you look at it. Verse 2, suppose ye, I'm not talking about Pilate, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things. Do you think that this happened to them because they were exceptionally wicked? Hallelujah. Notice Jesus answered their inquiry with a question. And what he did was the question went to the heart of their thinking because these pious people were not concerned with those Galileans. They believed in their heart of hearts that they got what they deserved. Remember, Jesus was surrounded by some hostile folk who was asking him questions. According to chapter 11, verse 54, it says, lying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they may accuse him. Yeah, so these Pharisees, verse 53 says, and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, waiting to catch him. So they pretended to be concerned about some people whom they felt got what they deserved. So Jesus, being Jesus, doesn't deal with Herod. Because it's not time for me to deal with Herod right now. It's time for me to deal with you. Do you think that this thing happened to them because of some exceptionally bad sin? That was in their lives. The question goes to the heart of their thinking. Do you think that this happened to them due to their exceptional sin? Is that why they suffered such things? He was asking. He was asking them, was this divine judgment? They weren't prepared for his response. And when he asked them this question, no one spoke up. Nobody could answer because, see, they thought that they could catch him, but they didn't see him coming. So that's the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gives you wisdom. Praise the Lord. When the devil is trying to trip you up and trap you, the, the Spirit of God will tell you what to do, and the Holy Ghost will tell you what to say. Jesus' response was so powerful that couldn't nobody answer. So he had to answer the question. He said, do you think? That this thing happened to them because they were exceptionally sinful? Had they said yes, then he would have said, well, why are you telling the story? Pretending that you cared for them. Praise the Lord. You already hate Herod. I already know that. They were trying to get him. So he says, do you think 
that it happened because they were wicked, that they got what they deserved, just like we often do. We often play God. I can't get any help. We often look over at someone who is suffering and say, yeah, they're reaping what they sow. Uh, but you got to be careful of that. Because Jesus gave the answer in verse uh, 3. He says, I tell you that the catastrophe that happened in, in their lives was not because they were sinners above all other sinners. He says, they did not deserve what they got. I can't get a witness. He says, I tell you no. No or nay. Now, he wasn't saying that it wasn't because sin was present. Because all have sinned. Amen. Sin is present in here. Where is it at? From the pulpit to the door. Is from where I'm standing to where you're sitting. And all in between. For the Bible teaches that all have sinned. Oh, I can't get any help today. The issue was, the issue was, he says, and I know that I'm sounding like a broken record, but I want you to get it. His question was not, do you think this happened to them because they were sinners? The question was, do you think that this happened to them because they were sinners above the rest of the Galilee? Like those 11 who were killed in Virginia Beach. Do you think that they were killed because they're the worst of the worst? No, they're people just like you, just like me. It could have been you, and it could have been me. Yes, Jesus says uh, uh, sin was there, but this thing didn't happen to them because they were exceptionally sinful. He said, for I say unto you, except you repent. You who have just told me the story. You shall uh, in likewise perish. Ah, uh, you shall likewise perish. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, since sin is present in all of our lives, then we all need to repent. Because the truth is, all of us, are living on borrowed time. What happened to the Galileans could have easily happened to any of us. But God gave us mercy. Oh, I feel my helper. And I heard Jesus say, well, since y'all want to talk to me about current events, let me give you one. See, they didn't tell Jesus about the 18. Jesus told them says, you've given me an example about the Galileans. Well, let me tell you what happened to some Jews down in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the, uh, the, or those 18 upon whom the tower of Shalom fell and slew them. Thank ye that they were sinners above all them that dwelt in Jerusalem. Do you think that the 18, I'll bring them up. You didn't mention them, he says. The wall fell on them, the old wall in Jerusalem near the juncture of the south and the east wall. An accidental death took place and 18 men lost their lives. 18 lives were snuffed out. They died a horrible death crushed by an incredibly heavy wall. Jesus said, do you think that what happened to them was because they were exceptionally sinful? Do you think that these 18 were murderers, killers, homosexuals, abortion providers, abortionists, adulterers, fornicators? Do you think that they were drug pushers, child molesters, pimps? Do you think that they were the dredges of society? Do you think that that's why this happened to them? Because see, some of us, because we're not guilty of those things, we try to act like we're not guilty of anything. But I'm here to say today that all of us are living on borrowed time. Can I get a witness? Jesus says, I tell you no. That didn't happen to them because 
They were the worst of the worst. And I say to you that except you repent, you shall likewise perish. So sin does play a role. But we can't, we can't play God and, and pretend that we don't need to repent. And we can't play God and say the reason that person ended up the way where they are is because they were worse sinners than we are. Mm -mm. Jesus said you all got to repent. Because the Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isn't it just like Patrick Wooden to, to, to preach against sin on Sunday and tell you that you have sinned and then turn around and ask you to say amen and then get on you because you won't get with me. But you don't have to get with me, but you better repent because we're living on borrowed time. What happened to the Galileans? What happened to the 18? could have just as easily happened to us. The other day when the tornado hit, it picked up a car and dropped it in a man's bedroom while a man was sleeping in his bed. And the man was killed, as you could imagine. But I wouldn't try to find out how that man lived. I wouldn't try to find out why it happened to him. This is a unfair sin cursed world instead of trying to find out why it happened to him we ought to thank God that it didn't happen to us so the big question is the big question is not why did these people have to die Jesus is trying to show them the issue is not why did the Galileans die or why did the 18 die but the big question is, what right do we have to live? For why did it happen to them and not happen to us? Because the truth is, every one of us have sinned enough to die like those Galileans died. Every one of us have sinned enough to die like the 18 died. Well, why are we here? I heard Jeremiah say in Lamentations 3 and 22, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassion faileth not. Since all of us have sinned, the Bible says in Romans 5 and 20 and 12, in the last clause, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then the Bible says in Romans 6 and 23, in the A clause, for the wages of sin is death. So the question is, why are we here? Why are we still alive? It's because God's been good to us. It's because we're living on borrowed time. Now the question is, what are you gonna do with your time? What are you gonna do with God's grace? I think we ought to realize that the Lord has been good to us, that God has been merciful to us, and we ought to purpose that for the rest of our lives, we're gonna live for the one who have been so good to us. We're gonna live for the Lord who let the plane, the plane take off and land on time, who let the cab fare, let the cab get us safely to our destination. He let us sleep through the night and he woke us up all of this morning. He didn't wake us up because we were that holy. He didn't wake us up because we were that wonderful. But he woke us up because he's so good. Yeah! And I don't know about you, but I want to take the time that I have left. The time that's borrowed time. I got a date with death. I got a date with destiny. But until then, I'm all in. Until then, I'm all in. 
You can have my hands. You can have my voice. You can have my feet. You can have my mind. Do I have anybody who will say, I'm all in. I'm going to serve him with my baritone. I'm going to live holy with my baritone. Yeah. Yes. Give him glory. Take somebody's hand and tell your neighbor, you're here. We're here because God's been good to us. I used to hear, I used to hear the deacon say, Deacon, Deacon Cameron say, it's not through any goodness that I've done. It's not through any, any wonderful things that I've done. He said, but the Lord is just good to me. And, and, and when I see, the next time you go to a funeral, you ought to say to yourself, that could have been me. And you ought to say to yourself, it should have been me. But God looked out for me. He had mercy on me. Yes, he did. So since he did, I think I'm going to make him glad that he did. Since he did, I think I'm going to live something. Walk something. Fight for life. Hallelujah. In this unfair world. Well, sometimes, sometimes, the plane crash. And there are believers just as holy of all, as all of us on that plane. Sometimes the house burned. And there are sanctified people who lost their life. Sometimes at the mall. And there's a killing. Saints' lives are taken. Sometimes driving down the road. A good sanctified young lady on her way home from church. We've seen it happen many times. Get killed in an accident. Saved like the Bible said. And they fell asleep and went on into glory. The question should never be, why did that happen to them? The question should be, why didn't it happen to me? The question shouldn't be, why did they have to die? Jesus is teaching and the question is, what right do we have to live? Do we have to be here? Jesus told them that if you don't get right, every one of you, are going to be just like those Galileans and just like the 18. They did not suffer what they suffered because they were exceptionally sinful. They were no more sinful than you who are telling me this story. So he says, except you repent. Except you repent. You will likewise perish. So isn't the Lord good? Oh my There are people who are no longer here People who are no longer here Who were good people One of my conundrums When God took my pastor home At an early age I knew of shyster preachers who kept living. Smoking preachers, drinking preachers, cussing preachers, preachers who wouldn't preach anything. And here's a holy man, gone. I learned that I was looking at it upside down. The truth is, none of us have a right to be here. All of us have enough sin present for if the Lord based it on that alone to take every one of us right now. Hence living on power time. But what are you going to do with your time? Those who say, preacher, I only have five minutes or so left. I want to get right with God in my time. I want, I want, I want, I want, I, I don't, I don't want the fate of the Galileans. I don't want to be like the 18. Hallelujah. 
Notice what Jesus, he gave the remedy, except ye repent. So repentance, 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 getting right, letting things go that ought to go. People have gotten busted and caught and all that kind of stuff. And you looked at them and said to yourself, you were doing worse than they were, but God had mercy on you. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? Do you, you still think you, you still try to be slick? Or do you make the best of that bar of time? God, it could have been me. So let me get right. The altar is open for those who said, Preacher, pray for me. I want to make the most of my time. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. Come. Come to the altar. Oh my. What a message. After the shut in. Whew. The truth is. The truth is. And I don't want you to do it. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the truth is. After I finish getting those who are going to come. Because then once I, once I settle. Then I'm not gonna let anybody else come. Cause sometimes you start praying, right. then folk get faith, and here they come inching, prolonging the thing. I got to go somewhere. Amen. I got to go to Charlotte today. So. Oh Lord, I ain't got but one thing to say. God has been good to me. Hey, hey, yes, I oh, God has. He's been good. The Lord, the Lord has. Everybody should have come to the altar if you were listening because there's not a soul in this building who would say preacher I didn't say that you weren't saved there's not a soul in this building who would say preacher I don't have sin in my life for the scripture teaches that if we say we have no sin we make him alive see and that was the point they were too smug in telling their story about the others like they thought they were safe and didn't need the altar. You're the ones that Jesus says, except you repent. You are likewise perish. When a call is given like that, no one is exempt. Because there's not a person in here who do not contend with something. And notice what I did. I made it easy to get you to the altar. I said, I kept saying, exceptional sins. Yes, See, because there are sins that we think are just egregious. No, we're not. not. He didn't say you had to be a child molester. He didn't say you had to be married to a man, brothers, or a sister with a sister. No, 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 no. Just, he, but he said to them, except you repent. He said, those people didn't suffer their fate because they were worse than you. They were no worse off. They were no more sinful than you are. And yet that happened to them. Saints, let him that thinketh he standeth. 
The Bible says, take heed yes, lest he fall. Amen. Don't never think that you're more saved than you are. That you're stronger than you are. For these on the altar, lift your hands. Lift your hands. Now before I pray, is there anybody on the altar who is in a backslidden condition? Praise the Lord. Preacher, I backslid. I walked away from the Lord. I want the Lord to restore me. If you are in a backslidden condition, raise your hand high. I want to pray for you. Come on, my brother right here. I want to separate. You can just stand over here. Come over here. Come on, my sister. Right over here. We're going to pray. For God is married to the backslider. God is married to the backslider. We're coming home today. And then, and then, and then, and then those of you who are saved, you just want to make, you want the Lord to deal with what's present that you know of. See, amen.